All right, I had no idea how long that, bu- that video was going to be this morning. Last time I got caught up here for about 90 seconds because I had no clue. So this, this morning I, I learned my lesson. I'm not going to do that. Um, my name is Nate. A lot of you guys have met me, have gotten to know me over the past three months already that I've been here. Um, but I'm, I work with uh, discipleship groups as well as with the worship ministry. So good morning. Good to see you. Um, how many of you have owned a house before? Okay, lots of people. You remember the first time you bought a house and you owned a house and they, they really tried to make it easy on you. At least I, I thought they tried to make it easy. I, I thought it was complicated at the time, except for now when we're trying to sell that house and purchase a second house. I, I just, I'm reminded of how much easier it was the first time because they, they know that you don't have any money and so they try to make it easy. They try to make the loans easy to get. They try to make the process a lot simpler for you when you're buying that first house. But now it's like we have to wait for money to come in before the money can go out or there's going to be a contingency and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it's this complicated process, but we're starting to go through that process because our kids go to school up near West Bend at this awesome nature school that I could talk for hours about, but I won't. But then we go, you know, we go to church down here in Tosa. So when we're talking to our real estate agent, we are trying to figure out where exactly do we want to live. Three months ago, we gave him about six communities. We were like, we could live in any of these communities. We'll just wait for the right house to pop up. Well, a couple weeks after that, we changed our mind and we contacted our real estate agent and we said, actually, can you cross off a couple of those and can you add this other community in? And it's happened like three or four times, including this week. We got to the point where I, my wife, Trish, and I, we were talking, and, and we were like, actually, it's just these three communities. We've, we've got it now. And so every single time I have to text him, I feel a little bit embarrassed because there's this sense of like, shouldn't you have known when you were going into this? Shouldn't you have known like what, where you actually wanted to live and like what kind of a house and like what you could afford? And we're like, yes, but we're also still figuring out. It's that question of what do you want that Brian asked us last week. It's the same question that Jesus asked his disciples. We, we heard about it last week when we heard from uh, the book of John, chapter 1. Jesus is asking these people who are following him, what do you want? But there's something really beautiful. Our, our real, my real estate agent, and he's also a believer, but, so I kind of connected these, but he said, actually, I really appreciate the fact that you know what you want. He's saying, don't ever feel bad that you're coming back to me with more information. It's actually really nice to get clarity on who you are and on what you want. It's, it's actually a really beautiful thing because all of us have these unseen motives. We have these parts of our heart that we think we know. But then we have to keep on going on through life and figure out even better. Like, I thought that I wanted this one thing, but in reality, I've been going on through my life and learning and growing, and now I realize I actually want something different. And God, it's the same. He doesn't shame us for that. He actually celebrates the fact that we figure out what we want. You know, this morning we're entering into this second week of this series entitled The Call. And Brian pointed us to that last week, this question that seems so simple on the surface. It's just that simple question of what do you want? As I was thinking about it this week, I thought it's, it's the most profound question that Jesus could have asked anyone. We're going to open up our scripture this morning to Mark chapter 10. Jesus is going to ask that same question of his disciples. Again, what do you want? In this case, this morning, he's going to ask that question What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do? We've been asked this question our whole lives by our parents, by teachers, by spouses. In fact, there's not a day that goes by where we're not asked it by somebody or where we're not asking ourselves, what do I want? So do you know? Do you know what you want? Do you know what you want in following Jesus? Why are you following him? Do you know where you're headed? Do you know what you want? You see, there's this incredible simplicity that comes when we figure it out. It helps us to narrow in on what is actually important about the life that we're living. And so on the one hand, there's what we want. 
And we're figuring it out. And then on the other hand, there's what God wants and what he would have for us. And as we hold those two things in tension, I want, I want to point out that it's, you can go to the next slide, it's actually the distance between what God wants for us and what we want for ourselves that determines our ability to experience his presence in our lives. It's the distance. So here's what I want. Here's what you want, God. And it's the distance between these two that determines our ability to experience his presence in our life. Think about it. Jesus actually invites people to pray for whatever they want. You remember that? He says, if you're praying in the spirit, you can ask for anything and it'll be given to you. And for any of us who have done a lot of praying in our lives, how many times have we asked for something and it didn't happen the way that we thought it would? Didn't happen in the, in the way that we thought we, we didn't get what we wanted. And, and that's because there's this distance between what we want and, and what God wants. And as those things start to overlap, we start to experience God in our lives. So we open up scripture. We open up to these stories. I love it. These teenage guys who are following Jesus, right? And we see them at their best a couple of times. And we see them at their worst where they're messing up. They're, they're, they really don't know what they're doing. They, they don't know what they want. And so they live their lives and they think they want one thing. And yet they follow Jesus and they experience the truth of his message at a foundational soul level. And they can't explain it. So we get to, to read about how they're processing through this and they're like, well, I know I want this, but you, Jesus, are saying this. And something about what you're saying, I can't explain it. I'm still in the process of figuring it out, but I, I know that I want that. You see, somewhere in my brain, I think that I want this, but on a soul level, I'm hearing what you're saying, Jesus. And I know, I actually, somewhere deep down, I want that. Because the life that we live on this earth so often takes away life from us. So we want these things, and we find that they actually drain the life out of us. We hear Jesus' words, and we start to follow him. They don't necessarily make sense, but we find that they start to give us life. And so we start to trust him more. And so this morning, I'm going to read a passage from Mark that highlights this inner conflict of the heart. I bet you felt that conflict before, too. So let's read it. This is from Mark chapter 10, verse 35. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? What do you want me to do for you? He asked. This is great. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the, cu uh, the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptized with this baptism, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And then when the other ten disciples heard about it, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles, that they lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, some of you think that these guys are stupid. And you're kind of, you're kind of right. I, I actually think there's a specific reason why Jesus called young guys to come and follow him. Because they are so often, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, they're so often just living at the surface level of stuff like, 
I want to do this, and then I want to do this, and then they're not really thinking through the full depth of what it is they're doing. A lot of us never really grow out of that all that well. But I want you to notice something beautiful about that. Uh, it's the first thing. Notice that Jesus doesn't shame these guys for having a big dream. I think so often I've read this passage throughout my life, and, and kind of something, the baggage that comes along with it, is that we think like, oh, Jesus is telling us to like be passive. He's telling us to take a back seat to life. He's telling us to just like be the least of all, and so we're not important, and so other people get to be great, but not me because I follow Jesus. I, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. He's not shaming these guys for having a big dream, for thinking big. What's he doing? He's redirecting them to consider the cost. He's redirecting them to consider the cost. Many of you are familiar with the 20th century uh, German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He had a front row seat to the atrocities of the Nazi regime. He wrote this great book that probably lots of you have read called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that first chapter on cheap grace, he says some things that really resonate with this idea of counting the cost. Here's some, some things that he said. He said, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It's the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all of their goods. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a person their life. And it's grace because it gives a person the only true life. Above all, it's costly because it costs God the life of his son. So what do you want? Do you really want the glory? Do you really want the greatness? Jesus is asking you. He's asking you, what do you want? Do you really want to sit on the left and the right hand side of Jesus? Oh, that's all? That's all you wanted? Just that? Jesus doesn't shame them for this desire, but he redirects them. He's like, you want something great? Good. Do you know what it's going to cost? Do you know what it's going to cost? He, he, he uses two metaphors that would just like fly right by us if we're not paying attention. So we're going to look at these two metaphors that he uses. Uh, the first one is this metaphor that he uses. Um, he, he tells us that we don't know what we're asking because we need to drink the cup that he drinks. To drink the cup that he drinks. So now stick with me. Ready? Two metaphors. The first metaphor has two sides, like two sides of a coin. It's drinking the cup that Jesus drinks. Now, this is language that would have resonated in their worldview, in their Hebrew worldview. If you go back through the Hebrew Bible, there's all this language about new wine abounding, about the presence of God being associated with wine. So they would look at the harvest, and they would look at the way that God provides everything for them. They would look at the way that their lives seem to get richer as they know God more. And one of the metaphors that they would use is this metaphor of wine of having like an overabundance, an overflow of life. So think of this. On the one side of the coin, it's like a king sitting at a banquet table with a full cup of wine, almost overflowing. And the king passes the cup around the table to everybody sitting at the banqueting table. It's an image of a king sharing his overflow, his abundance, his life with his people. It's this incredible Metaphor. It's actually the thing that they're reaching out for. They're saying, we want that. We want to sit on your left and your right hand. And Jesus says, great. But there's another side of the coin that we also read about all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, and it's called the cup of God's wrath. God's wrath. We don't like to use that kind of language very often, but think of it this way. God created a beautiful world with the overflow, the abundance, the richness of life. I mean, you, you watch Jesus going about talking and preaching and healing, and you're like, this is overflow, abundance of life. It's just pouring out of him, and people are following him. And he's saying, yeah, but it's also true that it's possible 
to say no to that kind of life, to think that we know what we want on our own terms. And against that is God's wrath. And so when he says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? On the one hand, he has in mind the glory, the goodness, the overflow of this eternal life in his mind. And on the other hand, he has in mind the cross. The fact that he was going to come and die so that we would never have to taste the wrath. We could participate in this life of God. It's drinking the cup that he drinks. All of that is packed into this one little metaphor that flew right by us. But he's, he's putting it in front of his disciples. The second, the second metaphor is to be baptized with his baptism. To be baptized in his baptism, it's a phrase, uh, you guys know when we do like the baptisms up here and we have the, this tub up here. I don't know what to call it. This thing up here. Take, take that out of your mind just for a second. Uh, some commentators have, have noted that this word baptism actually just means like to be submerged, to be engulfed in. Think of yourself as like swimming or like walking through a cornfield and you're just like submerged in it, right? It's just like all around you. And Jesus says, are you able to experience what I'm going to experience? And we're like, well, what is he going to experience? And again, he's got his mind on the cross. Uh, Paul, in the book of Romans, talks about this. He, he talks about our baptism and how we're linked to the death and resurrection of Jesus. He said he was up on a cross and he died. And then he went down into the grave and he was engulfed. He was in the ground, totally surrendered to death. He died. He really died. But then we come up out of that baptism into a new life. Our sin stays in the ground, but we come up into new life. And so he's looking at his disciples and he's saying, are you really on board? Do you know what you're asking? No, you probably don't, because guess where it's headed to? The cross. It's going to cost everything. It's going to cost everything. Are you getting a sense of what Jesus is saying to his disciples? You know, we come in here to worship on a Sunday morning. Here's my hope for us. My hope is that you have big dreams for your life. My hope is that you have ambition for your life, that whatever point in life you find yourself at right now, that you have a vision for where you are headed, for where you want to go. I don't care how old you are. If you're super young or you're really old or you're somewhere in between, I don't care. Do you have some vision of like, God wants me to go do something? That's good. That's a good vision to have. But here's what most of us never stop to realize. It's the assumption that I know how to get there best. I've got to figure it out. I know myself. I know where I'm headed. I know how to get there best. We have these visions and these dreams for our lives and everything in our culture tells us, you know how to do it best. Can't trust people. Trust yourself. Right? Or be true to yourself. And listen, there's something important about knowing yourself. You know, John Calvin says there's no knowledge of God without knowledge of self. It's incredibly important to understand the way you're wired and the way that God has given you. But here's the question. Do you know yourself well enough to know how fickle your heart is? Do you know yourself? Have you, have you lived long enough and reflected long enough on your life to realize that you can't be trusted all the time? You can't do it on your own. You might need help. And here's the deal. This cultural narrative to trust yourself, it's not entirely false. You can go and grab hold of those dreams. You can go and accomplish something according to your big plan. But the issue is that it's only a half truth. It'll only get you half of the way there, and your potential will always be limited by your capacity to imagine the result that you want. Your imagination is big. Listen, think of the disciples. They had this big imagination for what they, they could imagine, like, hey, we would love to sit on the throne. How awesome would that be? That's your maximum potential, then, is your ability to imagine that but here's the reality. What if God has something even bigger than that in mind? 
for you? What if God has something bigger in mind for you than what you can dream? What if our dreams aren't too big, but what if they're too small? I think that's the real confrontation this morning. It's like we have these ideas for our life and we're like, it, boy, if that would happen, my life would be great. And Jesus is like, actually, you might make yourself miserable if that happened. You assume that you know best. And Jesus looks at them, and he, I think he honestly loved them. He loved their hearts, but he saw right through their motivations. He saw right through their desires. He heard what they said that they wanted, and he knew better than to give it to them. How many of uh, you, if you've ever been around small children, if you, either your own or you've been taking care of somebody else's, how many of you, yeah, right, exactly. How many of you have heard requests like this from small children? Like, yeah, I just want to eat candy all day. How cool would that be? And you're like, yeah, you don't really know. <laughs> you don't have any idea what's good for you. Jesus knew that this motivation that these disciples had, it was not coming from a mind that was steeped in this kingdom of God reality of seeing the world. It was steeped in a desire for them to be better than their peers. That's why it says the other 10 disciples were indignant. It, that kind of a motivation, Jesus saw right through it and he loved them enough to save them from their perverted sense of what they thought that they wanted. All right, so have you been there? Have you looked, have you, have you been able to look back at your life and actually thanked God that you didn't get what you thought you wanted? I remember a couple years ago, uh, I was applying for a job out in Maryland. We, uh, Trisha's brother lives out in Annapolis. We just love the city. We thought this would be a cool place to go. So I applied for a couple jobs out there. We became a finalist at a job and they flew us out there. And it was a different church, about the same size as Meadowbrook, but different denomination. And the people were nice, but I remember kind of having this feeling at dinner the first night with the, the pastor and the staff and all of their families. And he just said a couple of things kind of off the cut, cuff that didn't sit well with me. But the weekend was okay. It was, it was a fine weekend. And, but I remember we were coming back, and, and I was kind of, I tend to feel optimistic about things. Like, yeah, this this could work. Like, I'm trying to convince myself this is a good idea. And I, I look at my wife, I'm like, so what did you think? Like, that could be okay, right? And right away, she was like, no, that's definitely not the right place. She just had this, like, clear idea. And, and of course, I kind of sat on the fence for a couple of weeks, and then I got an email a couple of weeks later, like, we've decided to go a different direction. You're not the right fit. And it was kind of like, okay, thank, thank goodness. And it kind of, like, revealed something, which is, like, I have a tendency to make something better than it is. But in retrospect, I look back and I'm so grateful God didn't give me what I thought I maybe might have wanted. You know, like a couple months later, COVID hit and everything was on lockdown. And I look back and I'm like, yeah, we would have been living across the country with no family, no friends, no, like, no real history in this church. It would have just been such a terrible situation. And so Jesus knows what we want. He looks at what we want, and he also knows what we actually need, what will set us free. And it looks strange. I, I don't know if you have the slide. It's, it's later on. It's, it says, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave at all. It's, it's counterintuitive. Like, we would never expect this is what we want. I remember being a, a kid growing up at Fort Wilderness, and we went there all the time. It's a camp up in northern Wisconsin. And I remember uh, I hit age 10, and my parents were like, why are we paying for camp all the time? Well, let's start working there so we don't have to pay, and you can still go up all the time, and you can work there. So as a 10-year-old, where do you think I wanted to work at camp? Oh, the canteen for sure, right? You get to like sell candy, or maybe like the archery range, like you just get to hang out. I love shooting archery. Like this, this is what a 10-year-old boy wants to do at camp. So where do you think they put us, me and my friends? Dish crew, of course. So you're getting elbow high in grease and you're scrubbing stuff. And I'm telling you, when we first walked into that dish room, I mean, and it's like 150 degrees in there, right? I was like, this is not what I want. This is not what I want. Like, I want to be in the canteen doing my own thing and having fun. And then something strange happened. I kind of started to like working a lot. I kind of discovered that I'm a person who really likes hard work. 
I'm a person who actually really likes to do cleaning and like, like deep work. Yeah, I know my wife is like, do you? Uh, <clears throat> I'm a person who likes to do like deep cleaning and like actually I still do love to do the dishes, but that like this whole servant heart kind of came unexpectedly. It, I never would have chosen that. I never would have wanted that, but it left me with this realization of like, God, you know my heart better than I know my heart. You know what I actually want, even though I thought I knew what I wanted. And so... This is uh, where I'm just going to leave us this morning, is that we have opportunities now. We have opportunities here at Meadowbrook. Uh, one of the cool things as a newcomer uh, is that I'm able to see some of these ministries that I know have been in like different places during COVID, but I'm able to see them all starting to ramp up again. And it's really cool. So some of you, as I look around the room, I'm like, I know there's so many people in this room who have done a ton of work, volunteered a ton, been in like different ministries. And first of all, just thank you. So I hope that throughout this series, you don't feel like we are telling you what to do. The way that I, I love it that Brian always puts it is that he says we are always wanting to offer people opportunities to step in to serving. And that's, that's really the reason why we're going through this call series is so that we can see like, hey, there's opportunities here. And it's not just that we need help. I mean, on a very like pragmatic level, it's like, sure, we could use some help in different opportunities. But there's actually something that happens to each of us when we do things that we thought we wouldn't really love that much. Like sometimes it's that. And sometimes it's a passion that you have. It's something that God has put in you and you're like, I would love to do that. Right? But sometimes it's unexpected. You find yourself serving in a way that you wouldn't have expected, and God starts to reveal your heart. So in just a moment, we're going to hear another interview. Um, but before we do, would you pray with me? Lord, my prayer this morning is that we'd be able to open our hearts to ask a simple question, not merely asking ourselves, what do I want, but but being open to what Jesus wants to do in our lives. God, we trust that you know us better than we know ourselves. So we say thank you in advance for those who serve here, and we pray that you might be able to surprise us this morning. Push us, nudge us, allow us to be surprised by what it is you might be calling us into next. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our midst. And we pray it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.